Warning that masks in indoor transportation corridors may still be necessary. The latest on the back and forth of the mass mandate battle coming up in just minutes. Plus, later in the show, we're going to hear from the CEO of a local nonprofit that traveled to Poland to help the people of Ukraine. He's going to share his group's firsthand experience at the scene of a war and the importance of volunteers during this time. And almost 9 o'clock on your Thursday morning. Lots of clouds, a few sprinkles perhaps out there, and a decent chance of rain in the extended forecast. We will get Justin's take coming up. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It is Thursday. It is April 21st, and we just want to let you know we are standing by for an ABC News special report. That's right. For now, we're starting off human. We'll be checking in with Justin later on as well. But for now, let's look at today's 9 at 9. The Justice Department is filing an appeal to try to overturn a judge's order that voided the federal mask mandate on planes and trains and in travel hubs. The notice came minutes after the CDC asked the DOJ to appeal the decision handed down by a federal judge in Florida earlier this week. Right now, the CDC says it is necessary for the public health to require masking in indoor transportation corridors. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his forces not to storm the last remaining Ukrainian stronghold in Mariupol, but to block it, quote, so that not even a fly comes through, end quote. The defense minister told Putin that a steel plant where Ukrainian forces were holed up was securely blocked, leaving the plant in Ukrainian hands. However, robs the Russians of the ability to declare complete victory in Mariupol. The city's capture has both strategic and symbolic importance. Yesterday's parachute demo at the Washington Nationals baseball game that caused a brief evacuation at the U.S. Capitol has suggested a major communications failure between the military and Capitol Police. It's more remarkable because of Washington's focus on improving security since the January 6th Capitol attack. A British judge has now issued an official order for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's extradition to the U.S. That means the final decision will now rest with the United Kingdom's Home Secretary. If extradited, Assange would face trial in a U.S. court. He has been charged under the Espionage Act for conspiring to obtain and then publish thousands of classified U.S. diplomatic cables related to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and what the Justice Department has called one of the largest compromises of classified information in the history of the U.S. A state investigation has found the Rust movie crew willfully violated safety rules on the New Mexico film set last October. That's when actor Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The report says the film's production management team knew gun safety procedures were not being followed and the crew demonstrated plain indifference to employee safety. The state of New Mexico has fined the production company nearly $137,000, the maximum allowed by state law. And let's go to an ABC News special report. The president about to speak. My cabinet members, including the Secretary of Treasury and others, and uh, we had a, a good discussion. I've talked about what I'm about to tell you about today, as well as uh, he was thanking the American people for their support, understands it's significant, and uh, was uh, we talked about keeping everyone together in terms of Europe, the European Union, and others in the effort to uh, stop Putin's uh, brutality. Uh, but uh, before I head out to the West Coast, I want to quickly uh, update the American people on the latest steps we're taking to support the people of Ukraine and to hold Putin accountable for his brutal and bloody war. Russian forces have retreated from Kyiv, leaving behind them a horrifying evidence. And you've seen it, you've reported it, you folks. And by the way, I, I, I don't say this often, but I think we should give enormous credit to the folks with your agencies that are on the ground in Ukraine, in these spots. And uh, they're, they're really, uh, I've spoken to several of them. It's, uh, we owe them. But uncovering these evidences of their atrocities and war crimes against Ukrainian people is so clear to the whole world now. Now they've launched and refocused their campaign to seize new territory in eastern Ukraine. And we're in a critical window now of time where that they're going to set the stage for the next phase of this war. And the United States and our allies and partners are moving as fast as possible to continue to provide Ukraine the forces that they need, the weapons they need, excuse me, the equipment they need. Their forces need to defend their nation. 
Last week, I signed an $800 million package of security assistance to Ukraine that included new capabilities like artillery systems and armored personnel carriers, equipment that is responsive to Ukraine's needs and tailored to support the intensified fighting in the Donbass region, which is a different war than in other places because both topographically it's different. It's flat, it's, it's not in the mountains, and it requires different kinds of weapons to be uh, more effective. Today, I'm announcing another $800 million to further augment Ukraine's ability to fight in the east, in the Donbass region. This package includes heavy artillery weapons, dozens of howitzers, and 144,000 rounds of ammunition to go with those howitzers. It also includes more tactical drones. In the past two months, we've moved weapons and equipment to Ukraine at record speed. We've sent thousands of anti-armor and anti-missile helicopters, drones, grenade launchers, machine guns, rifles, radar systems. More than 50 million rounds of ammunition had already been sent. The United States alone has provided 10 anti-armor systems for every one Russian tank that's in Ukraine, a 10 to 1 ratio. We're sharing and will continue to share significant timely intelligence with Ukraine to help to defend them against Russian aggression. And on top of this, these direct contributions from the United States, we're facilitating, we're the outfit facilitating the significant flow of weapons and systems to Ukraine from other allies and partners around the world, like the S-300 long-range anti-aircraft systems that Slovakia recently transferred to Ukraine. We are getting them in there. We won't always be able to advertise everything we, uh, that our partners are doing to support Ukraine and fight for freedom, but to modernize Teddy Roosevelt's famous advice, sometimes we will speak softly and carry a large javelin, because we're sending a lot of those in as well. You know, but we're not, we're not sitting on the funding that Congress has provided for Ukraine. We're sending it directly to the front lines of freedom to the fearless and skilled Ukrainian fighters who are standing in the breach. You got to admit, you have, must be amazed at the courage of this country, the resolve that they're showing, not just the mili their military, but the average citizen, men and women, young, young men, young women as well. It's, you know, the sustained and coordinated support of the international community, led and facilitated by the United States, has, is a significant reason why Ukraine is able to stop Russia from taking over their country thus far. Every American taxpayer, every member of our armed forces can be proud of the fact that our country's generosity and the skill and service of our military helped arm and repel Russia's aggression in Ukraine. To beat back Putin's savagery, that tried to seize Ukraine's capital and wipe out Ukraine's government. The Battle of Kyiv was a historic victory for the Ukrainians. It was a victory for freedom, won by the Ukrainian people with unprecedented assistance by the United States and our allies and our partners. Now, now we have to accelerate that assistance package to help prepare Ukraine for Russia's offensive that's going to be more limited in terms of geography, but not in terms of brutality, not in terms of brutality. Combined with our recent drawdowns, it will ensure a steady flow of weapons and equipment into Ukraine over the next few weeks. However, with this latest disbursement, I've almost exhausted the drawdown authority I have that Congress authorized for Ukraine in a bipartisan spending bill last month. In order to sustain Ukraine for the duration of this fight, Next week, I'm going to have to be sending to Congress a supplemental budget request to keep weapons and ammunition flowing without interruption to the brave Ukrainian fighters and continue to deliver economic assistance to the Ukrainian people. Hope, and I, my hope is, and my expectation is, Congress would move and act quickly. And I want to thank the Congress, Democrats and Republicans, for their support for the people of Ukraine. Our unity at home our unity with our allies and partners and our unity with the Ukrainian people is sending an unmistakable message to Putin. He will never succeed in dominating and occupying all of Ukraine. He will not, that will not happen. In addition to bolstering Ukraine's resistance on the battlefield, we're also demonstrating our support for the people of Ukraine. Today, the United States is announcing that we intend to provide an additional $500 million in direct economic assistance to the Ukrainian government. This brings our total economic support for Ukraine to $1 billion in the past two months. This is money the government can help use to stabilize their economy, 
to support communities that have been devastated by the Russian onslaught and pay the brave workers that continue to provide essential services to the people of Ukraine. You know, these past weeks have seen a terrible human cost of Putin's ambition for conquest and control. Approximately two-thirds, two-thirds of all Ukrainian children have been displaced from their home. More than five million Ukrainians have fled their country. It's an absolute outrage. The idea this is happening, approaching the second quarter of the 21st century, is just, yeah. Last month when I was in Europe, I announced that the United States would welcome 100,000 Ukrainians so that we share in the responsibility of supporting Ukrainians fleeing Putin's war machine. We've already welcomed tens of thousands of Ukrainians to the United States, and today, I'm announcing a program, Unite for Ukraine, a new program to enable Ukrainians seeking refuge to come directly from Europe to the United States. This new humanitarian parole program will complement the existing legal pathways available to Ukrainians, including immigrant visas and refugee processing. It will provide an expedient channel for secure legal migration from Europe to the United States for Ukrainians who have a U.S. sponsor, such as a family or an NGO. This program will be fast, it will be streamlined, and will ensure the United States honors its commitment to go to the, to the people of Ukraine and need not go through our southern border. We're also continuing to ratchet up the pressure on Putin and further isolate Russia on the world stage. Yesterday, the Treasury Department rolled out additional measures to crack down on the entities and individuals attempting to evade our unprecedented sanctions, not just ours, but throughout the West. Today, I'm announcing that the United States will ban Russian-affiliated ships from our ports, as they did in Europe. That means no ship, no ship that sails under the Russian flag or that is owned or operated by a Russian interest will be allowed to dock in the United States port or access our shores. None. None. This is yet another critical step we're taking in concert with our partners in the European Union, United Kingdom, Canada, and further to deny Russia the benefits of international economic system that they so enjoyed in the past. We don't know how long this war will last, but as we approach the two-month mark, here's what we do know. Putin has failed to achieve his grand ambitions on the battlefield. After weeks of shelling Kyiv, Kyiv still stands. President Zelensky and his democratically elected government still remain in power. And the Ukrainian armed forces, joined by many brave Ukrainian civilians, have thwarted Russia's conquest of their country. They've been bolstered from day one by an unstinting supply of weapons, ammunition, armor, intelligence from the nations of the free world led by us, the United States. As Russia continues to grind out the military advances and their military advances and the brutalities against Ukraine, Putin is banking on us losing interest. That's been my view. You heard me say this from the beginning. He was counting on NATO, European Union, our allies in, in Asia, cracking, moving away. He's betting on Western unity will crack. He's still betting on that. And once again, we're going to prove him wrong. We will not lessen our evolve. We're going to continue to stand with the brave and proud people of Ukraine. We will never fail in our determination to defend freedom and oppose tyranny. It's as simple as that. So again, I want to thank the American people. Thank the American people for their support of the Ukrainian people. This is our, this is our responsibility, it seems to me. And we've been able to hold the whole world together in this effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to take just one or two questions. What I got does, a plane what, does, to catch. what does Putin claiming control over Mariupol mean? Is that how significant is that? Well, first of all, it's questionable whether he does control Mariupol. One thing for sure we know about Mariupol: he should allow humanitarian carters to let people on that steel mill and other places that are buried under rubble to get out. To get out. That's what any 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 head of state would do in such a circumstance. And so uh, there is no evidence yet that Mary Paul has completely fallen. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, on Title 42, sir, are you considering delaying lifting Title 42? No, what I'm considering is continuing to hear from my, uh, my uh, well, first of all, there's going to be an appeal by the Justice Department. 
because as a matter of principle, we want to be able to be in a position where if, in fact, it is strongly concluded by the scientists that we need Title 42, that we be able to do that. But there has been no decision on extending Title 42. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. President, how long can the U.S. maintain the level and pace of this military support for Ukraine? I, well, we have the capacity to do this for a, a long time. Um, the question is, uh, are we going to continue to maintain the support of the international community and keep the pressure on Putin to prevent him from overrunning the country, number one, and number two, make sure we continue to maintain the economic sanctions, which over time, and we're beginning to see it, are devastating their economy and their ability to move forward. So the most important thing right now is maintain the unity. So far, so good. Thank you very much. All right, President Biden reporting from the uh, White House, updating us on this new $800 million aid package to Ukraine, including artillery and more ammunition. The president announcing so far the United States has provided more than 50 million rounds to the Ukrainian armed forces thus far. We look for much more on the president's speech and a breakdown of the new aid package coming up at our later newscasts and all world news tonight with David Buer. And also we had to break into programming, which broke into our news update the night at nine. If you want to catch that, it's on KSET's YouTube page. And for now, we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back. It's 917. It's been a pretty humid morning so far. Waiting on some rain. 918. It is a Thursday, and if I recall, that's our update day on the drought monitor. It is. Uh, and it's it's like, you know, every time every Thursday it just gets worse, it feels like. But yeah. we do need to update you on know, where we are on the drought. 87% of the state in drought in across South Texas. It continues to grow, the drought that is. You see the red colors, that represents extreme. When you get into this maroon color, that is exceptional and that's as high as we go when it comes to ranking these droughts so basically san antonio and points west it's uh it's bad situation we did get a little bit of rain this week in places like del rio thankfully a place that needed it very badly if you're watching us from east to san antonio hey you're not out of the woods either i mean we've got severe drought there stretching all the way to our eastern counties and as we look at the uh the reservoirs the area reservoirs and lakes the numbers aren't great here either. Uh, Medina Lake, 20% full. It's down 54 feet, uh, down 16 feet from last year. Canyon, which is a pretty steady level lake, it's at 97%, so still doing okay. Choke Canyon, 40%, and then Amistad, 44%. It's down 55 feet and down 7 feet from last year. So all of these reservoirs could use some rain, and we do have some in the forecast, and it's looking better and better, more promising as we get into next week. But we've got to wait about four days here before that happens. The cloud cover, fairly expansive this morning, uh, covers the entire viewing area, so it'll take some time for this to break up. We've had some light drizzle here and there, but that has not been a big issue. Temperature-wise, 72, Boulevard 75, New Braunfels 73, and Seguin 76 down there in Pleasanton, and that's the scene outside. Still cloudy, 77, as I mentioned, uh, Stinson 74, Kelly 73, Randolph, and light uh, east southeasterly winds. Now, these winds will pick up again this afternoon and be a little bit gusty like yesterday. Dew points in the 70s. That puts us in the oppressive category. And this uh, mugginess doesn't go away either. We have high pressure sort of parked over the southeast. Southeasterly wind right into Texas. And there is all that moisture. And it's spreading north now, too. So most of, most of Texas dealing with some pretty humid conditions. It's not leading to any rain, though. It's just uh, some of those little clouds. Uh, that's all we're dealing with this morning. Zooming out, we've got some showers, some storms and some snow up across the northeast and then more unsettled weather across the Pacific Northwest. And that's the next storm system. This is the one that hopefully brings us some decent chances for rain. Hot and humid Saturday ahead of a frontal boundary. And then this front sinks south by Sunday evening. 20% chance of some showers and storms late on Sunday. And I think this is probably during the evening hours. And then by Monday, some good chances for rain, 40 to 60 percent chance of rain, I'd say showers and some storms mixed in there. And then by tomorrow or tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, uh, the rain will be lingering around, but probably coming to an end. And then Tuesday will dry out some as far as rainfall totals go, potential rainfall totals. And these are just estimates at this point. 
Uh, the highest totals look to be out west, which is really good news. Uh, maybe up to an inch in some spots, close to a half an inch around San Antonio, and then a quarter of an inch as you go east, as long as this plays out as it is forecast to. So that is uh, looking better and better. Forecast for today, 76 by 11 o'clock, 77 noontime. Mostly cloudy, it's partly cloudy this afternoon, up around 86. And then uh, staying in the 80s, even through the 8 o'clock hour, with those southeast Julie winds becoming fairly gusty. 88 Friday, 87 Saturday, 88 Sunday. So basically the same kind of weather each and every day through Sunday. And then we add in those rain chances. As we get into Monday, 60% chance. And temperatures cool down too, 77 Monday, 78 on Tuesday. All right, looks good after the weekend. Yes. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. 922, about 74 degrees. And stay with us. David will be back with the morning headlines after the break. In your other morning headlines, the president ready to unveil a new drug control policy. And Jada Pickett-Smith is almost ready to talk about the Oscar slap. Plus, Best Buy is getting into the recycling business and a nine-year-old reaching the pinnacle of her craft. David Sears is here to explain all of that this morning. Good morning, Mr. Sears. Karate Kid got nothing on this young girl. All right. Not a bit. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's start with this. President Joe Biden just heard him talking about the war in Ukraine. Well, he is set to unveil his first national drug control strategy later on today. There are two main objectives to address the untreated, addicted, and drug trafficking. The CDC estimates that nearly 107,000 people died due to overdoses during a 12-month span from November of 2020 to November of 21. One of the priorities is harm reduction, also access to disorder treatment. The program will aim at disrupting drug trafficking organizations as well. Sounds like a typical Hollywood movie, trying to leverage all the publicity out of something good or bad. The latest example, the Will Smith Oscar slap Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett, says her family is focused on healing after the Oscars slap. But Pinkett Smith has that Facebook show, Red Table Talk. Apparently a new episode premiered and she mentioned it, but didn't really go into details because she says that she and her family will discuss the incident on her show when the time is right. So what do you got to do? You got to keep watching the show. Remember during the Oscars, Chris Rock told a joke about Pinkett's baldness. Of course, it stems from a medical condition. Will Smith walked up on stage and slapped him. Smith has since resigned from the Academy and they banned him from attending any Academy events for the next 10 years. Best Buy now buying into recycling. Your old electronics. The company will send someone to your house and they'll haul off up to two items per visit. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They are calling it the Best Buy standalone haul-away service. I want to see them paint that on the side of a truck. They will come get TVs, washing machines. They'll pick up small items like laptops and game consoles. So what's the catch, you ask? Glad you asked, because it ain't cheap. They will charge you 200 bucks a pickup. Then there's the opportunity for them to make a little bit more money if they fix up the old appliances and computers and resell them. The store does say it is the largest collector of e-waste in the country. And finally, I want you to meet Sufina Graho from Rhode Island. She is nine years old and she only weighs 64 pounds. And she is one of the top ranked Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitors in the world. She started learning the art of Jiu Jitsu just two years ago. Now she competes in tournaments and wins and wins and wins. She competes against boys and girls. She is ranked 15th in the 18 and under age group. And she is headed off to an international competition in Florida this summer. I'm really excited for that because last time um, I got third place, then the last time I got second place, now I'm trying to go for gold. She's very athletic, you know, and she's very like, you teach a position that she really want to learn. Now, one of the reasons she says she got into jujitsu is she wanted to be able to protect herself from bullies as she gets older. Oh. I don't think she's going to have a nah. problem. And <laughs> if I was a guy or a girl who wanted to bully her, that would be a major mistake. Yeah. She would probably say in the sweetest voice possible, bring it. Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if, if, and if you're one of her smart classmates, mm -hmm. you'll just hang with her. Right. Yes. All yeah. the time if yeah. you're worried ah. about getting bullied. So Absolutely. That, that's a good way to eliminate bullying in school. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. That right there. All right. Thank you, David. All right. See you in a bit. Right now, 928, about 74 degrees. More ahead on GMSA at 9. Including the latest on the situation in Ukraine and an update on a local nonprofit's trip to Poland to help Ukrainian re refugees get the help that they desperately need.
32 in bunkers, basements and shelters. Thousands of Ukrainians are enduring relentless and devastating attacks and airstrikes as Russia presses its offensive across eastern Ukraine. In the battered city of Maripol, the commander of the Ukrainian militia holed up in a steel factory and says the city is under constant bombardment. CNN's Rafael Romo has a report from Lviv. It's a last-ditch, desperate effort to save the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians and members of Ukraine's armed forces currently trapped in the southern port city of Mariupol. Two top Ukrainian officials say they're ready to head to Mariupol to negotiate the evacuation of soldiers and civilians. That's according to a captain with Ukraine's Azov Regiment, the last combat unit defending Mariupol. The two officials are Ukrainian parliamentary majority leader David Arhamia and Mikhailo Podol. Oliak, advisor to the president's chief of staff, who say they're ready to meet face to face with the Russians in order to save those trapped. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky earlier said that some 120,000 people remain trapped in Mariupol. He also said his country's army does not have enough weapons to defeat Russia in the southern port city. Meanwhile, Russia conducted an intercontinental ballistic missile test Wednesday. President Vladimir Putin said it was a Sarmat missile, a unique weapon designed to ensure Russia's security from external threats and provide food for thought. He said for those who in the heat of frenzied aggressive rhetoric try to threaten Russia. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said that such testing is routine and that it was not a surprise that the United States was notified in advance and that the ballistic missile was not a threat to the United States or its allies. European Council President Charles Michel became the latest leader to visit Ukraine Wednesday after visiting Borodyanka, the site where Ukrainian officials found massacred civilians after the Russian withdrawal. Michel said what happened there are atrocities and war crimes. Rafael Romo, CNN, Lviv, Ukraine. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we told you about members of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio heading to Poland to get a firsthand account of what's going on with the war in Ukraine. Well, now the group has returned, and this morning we are joined by the president and CEO of the nonprofit, Nami Ikolov, to tell us what they experienced over there. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good. you for having me. Thanks for being here, Nami. Good morning to you. Can you tell us uh, about what you saw and uh, what we are not seeing here in the United States in day-to-day -day coverage? Absolutely. As, as you just aired, there, what we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis is pretty much the occurrences of the situation in Ukraine in the status of war. Um, what we had the opportunity to see was actually the refugees that are making it out of Ukraine and um, what's happening with them, how they're being taken care of, the process of, of being able to help them find an, some kind of a normal life after escaping the scenes that, that are being shown right now. And how are the local contributions here being used to support victims over there? Sure. So when we were there, we were able to hear some incredible stories. Um, it was just story after story in terms of each individual experience. There was um, a vascular surgeon, a, um, a mother of two, who uh, had to just grab her two daughters. She was uh, living in the Donbass region. She, she grabbed her two daughters, uh, their two dogs, got into the car and just drove west. Um, it took them about seven days to get out of the Donbass region, spending time on, um, on people's floors, on couches, and being able to make it finally to, um, to the Ukraine-Poland border, at which time um, they were basically greeted with, with tents of, uh, of volunteers trying to give them whatever they needed, whether it was food, water, um, even a phone charging station, uh, you know, something in 21st century we, we don't really think about, but uh, people didn't have places to charge their phones as they were escaping. So finally they were able to, to charge their phones at the border and, and, um, and be able to call their loved ones back in Ukraine. Um, also, there were hotels um, after being processed at the border, they're put onto buses and taken to a humanitarian aid center where they're given a little bit of respite, uh, some cots to, for a day or two while they're processed and identified. And, um, and then they get to choose the countries or if the countries have space in Europe to be able to house them, um, they're, they're, they make application for it. And then they sort of make their way, uh, con again, continuing west. 
We also spent um, some time in Warsaw where the Jewish community um, uh, uh, has supported the, the, the rental of hotels. Uh, basically, at the peak of the refugees escaping, there were as many as nine hotels um, completely booked up, uh, paid for by donations locally to be able to help these refugees get some, some you know, have a shower, have a, have a, a little bit of privacy, um, be able to help some of these families. Um, we heard the stories of, of one young adult, a 20-year-old grandchild, um, who was sharing that their family are very much a patriarch and matriarch family, and the grandparents didn't want to leave. Uh, they didn't want to leave their home that they had built over over the you know the last number of decades, and um, and it wasn't until two weeks of no electricity in freezing cold temperatures um, and two weeks of of no water where they had to go to a, a local well to to access some some basic um, water access that the grandfather um, was finally diagnosed with frostbite on his feet that the family said, okay, you're losing your, your you know, we're, we're, we're taking away your veto power to leave. And they basically put him in the car, drove him across the border, um, had to leave the car obviously at the border and then walk across uh, into Poland where they were helped along to these hotels. Um, the scenes are, are incredible. It's just, it's, it's one story after another. Um, there was a lady from Odessa um, on the border, on the, the coastal of uh, city of Odessa, that re when she, re she remembers when she was two years old, um, the bombs of the Nazis bombing from the waters on the, the coastline of Odessa and her being <laughs> taken, you know, by her family, uh, you know, into a hiding. And now as, a, as an 80 um, something year old, she was the matriarch of the family telling them, OK, it's time to get out again. Um, you, you know, it's um, it's a it, it was a pretty incredible experience. I bet it was. Nami, real quick, we only have a few seconds left. What, what else can people here do to help in this effort? Sure. So we're really investing our time and energy into the, the Republic of Moldova. Um, that's really it's the poorest country in Europe. The average um, income is three thousand three hundred dollars per year. Uh, and so we are really helping the locals be able to help the refugees that are coming across the border there. Um, unfortunately, part of this trip, we weren't able to actually get into Moldova. Uh, Chisinau, the capital, uh, the airport there is completely closed up. So, so we were only able to sort of help by sending some of the supplies that were donated here. Um, we, are, we are raising funds here still. 100% of every dollar that we raise is going directly to helping these refugees and the locals in crisis. Um, you know, we, we appreciate every penny. Um, every penny makes a difference. And, and we really want to make sure that, that we continue this fight. Uh, the, the greatest fear that the refugees have is that, that the attention of the West um, will only last for so long. Mm -hmm. And the devastation and the, you know, the time it will take to rebuild is, is unlimited at this point. All right, Nami Ikalov, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Nami. Really appreciate it. Thank you both. Of course. Nami Ikalov with the Jewish Federation of San Antonio joining us live. Let's go outside right now. Where'd the sun go, Steph? <laughs> well, we thought it was going to come out. Sneak out a little bit, I guess. Oh, it's going to take a little more time. It, it will be out again this afternoon, just like yesterday. We're kind of stuck in that pattern, right? Morning clouds and then some afternoon sun. Right now, temperatures are in the mid-70s. It's warm, it's humid. 74 degrees in town, 77 Pleasanton, closing in on 80 down there in Katua. And forecast for the next couple days, again, more of the same. Morning clouds, warm and humid in the afternoon. Temperatures in the upper 80s for the most part. That's what you can expect through really Sunday before things change. And there are some good changes in the forecast. We've got rain chances now uh, Sunday night into Monday. And we've upped those rain chances to a 60% chance. Showers, some storms on Monday. It'll be cooler. A lot of good news there. We will take it. Pollen count, mold is high, oak is high. Mold actually jumped up above oak there as oak seems to be on the, the downside, we hope. It's at 1,880 today. And uh, looking at today's forecast, uh, 77 noontime, sun starts to reappear. Then we're in the mid 80s this afternoon, mostly cloudy to partly cloudy and breezy. Southeasterly winds anywhere from 10 to 15 miles per hour and gusty, guys.
Thank you, Justin. 942, about 74 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9, and coming up after the break, we're going to share the story of a young girl who has found a purposeful use for junk mail that can help plants grow. Today, tomorrow, and every day, a young girl from Colorado is saving the world. And she's doing it by using junk mail, essentially as a kind of fertilizer. ABC's Will Gann shares her story as we get ready to celebrate Earth Day tomorrow. Most of it is not for anyone in our house. It's junk mail. When it comes to junk mail, Izzy Hayward says it's time to cut it out. Every day I go to the mailbox to get mail for our house. It's one of my jobs and I hate it. The Colorado 11 year old writing about it in an essay for school. It's estimated that over 100 million trees are used annually to produce junk mail. Let's make some seed bombs. Izzy doing a little digging of her own and stumbling across this YouTube short from Arts Nursery Garden Home on how to recycle organic material like paper into something called seed bombs, which are great for growing flowers. An idea taking root in the elementary schooler's mind. Could junk mail be turned into seed bombs? This one is already sprouting, but you just throw it out somewhere and it starts growing or if it rains, it breaks open. Izzy teaming up with her grandma to cut the junk mail into pieces and blend it with water, packing the pulp into a cheesecloth with soil and seeds, draining it, and leaving it to dry for 24 hours. After that, like Izzy says, you can literally just throw it into the wilderness and it should sprout. There you go, people are gonna think we're littering over here. <laughs> Izzy's goal is to inspire more people to make seed bombs for their own backyards. As for the companies that make all that junk mail. They don't have to stop sending junk mail. They just need to replant what they cut down. You saw Izzy tossing her seed bombs around her local park, but experts say you can toss them into your home garden or chuck them into alleyways and roadway medians to make some urban areas a little more green this Earth Day. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. You know what I realized yesterday, Steph? Hmm. Given the setting, in the right place at the right time, Justin Horn looks like a school vice principal. Oh, yeah, and right he, behind in, you. In the picture you're about mm -hmm. to show. See? <laughs> See? He does. Everybody, listen, listen. <laughs> eyes on me, eyes on me, right? Uh, you you know can what? hear me clap twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I, if only that worked, though. You know, for my kids, it doesn't. But anyway. Right. Where, where <laughs> was this? Uh, this was Mission Academy. We did a little career day yesterday. It was drawn by some other professionals. It was awesome. I wanted to give them a shout out. I promised I would. Oh. Uh, the kiddos there at Mission Academy were great. Thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully we can do a few more of these. Uh, let's look at the rainfall now. Uh, San Antonio at 2.65 inches for the year. We're still below the average by about five inches. So yes, it has been awful dry. Del Rio, half an inch. It doesn't look so great, right? But that is an addition to what they had. They were stuck at 0.19 for so long. They did get some rain a couple days ago, but still three inches below average there. Austin is about the only place now that is above average and we look at the aquifer it is uh, steadily dropping still we're down at 646.7 it's 10 day average is 647.3 so we're in stage two once a week watering of course between 7 and 11 and 7 and 11 p.m time lapse a lot of clouds this morning we haven't seen sun yet it's going to take a few more hours before that happens 74 degrees south south, south southeast really winds at about 10 dew point is at 70 so it's way up there very very sticky this morning 75 New Braunfels, 72 Kerrville, 74 New Valley, close to 80 already in Katua, but mostly 70s here around Bear County, 75 in Divine, 75 out there in Hondo as well. It's going to be a windy day. Yesterday we had those gusts up around 25, 30 miles per hour. You can expect pretty much the same today. Those are those southeasterly winds that's bringing in all of that moisture. Gusts to 2025, 20, I think, as we get into the afternoon and evening, especially. Temperatures today. By noontime, 77 here in town, and then later today, probably around 86 or so. You'll see some 90s, I think, down to the south and west, especially if the sun pops out, but mostly uh, mid to upper 80s here around San Antonio, and it's the cloud cover. If we didn't have these clouds, we'd be probably well into the 90s, but this cloud cover helps to keep temperatures in check, and then once we see a little bit of sun, the temperatures jump up some. 
uh, but a lot of cloud cover here around South Texas today, and we had a little drizzle earlier. Uh, not much though. Big picture shows we've got uh, showers and storms lining up across uh, the eastern half of the country, some snow up in parts of Canada and the higher elevations of the west and a new system coming on board here across the Pacific Northwest. And as we've been talking about, this is the system that will bring us some decent chances for rain. It's going to help to create a front here. That front sinks south. And by late on Sunday, there's a small chance for some showers and storms. That is a time frame, and I'd say this is Sunday evening, so most of your weekend is going to be just fine. But Sunday evening, where we could see a strong storm or two, depending on where this front is located, but by the time we get into Monday, I think it's just some good rain. Uh, this is 3 o'clock Monday, and we br brought up the rain chances to 60%. And some showers may linger into Tuesday morning. Uh, as far as rainfall goes, you're going to see some really good rainfall. Dallas up to parts of Oklahoma. But even the western parts of our viewing area should see some decent amounts, maybe above 3 quarters of an inch. Here in San Antonio, we're projecting somewhere in the range of about half an inch and then a little less as you go off to the east. These are just estimates, but look, that's that's a good amount considering what we've uh, been through so far, and we will definitely take it. Uh, upper 80s through the weekend. There's that front with a 60% chance of rain and overcast skies on Monday. 70s for highs both Monday and Tuesday. Thank you very much, Justin. 951 about 74 degrees. We'll be right back. Well, this week we've already been talking about the big air show out at JBSA Randolph on Saturday and Sunday. If you're looking for something else fun to do this weekend, it's back. The 75th annual Poteet Strawberry Festival will be going on. It's usually before Fiesta, but that changed this year since Fiesta happened earlier than normal. Yeah, a lot earlier. So the <laughs> Strawberry Festival will be going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so you got some time to, you know, figure out which day you want to go to. Uh, you can find this information about the Poteet Strawberry Festival on our website. That's kset.com. If you plan it right, you can do both. Yes. Go to, go to go to the strawberry and then go see the Thunderbirds. Yeah. It's strategic about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the weather's going to cooperate too. We'll have temperatures in the 80s. It'll be humid, a little bit windy. I will tell you though, if you're going to be out at these events, you're going to be outside for a long period of time. You know, take some water with you, take some sunscreen. It's one of those kind of weekends. It's not until Monday that we see the rain chances come back into the forecast and a good chance that hopefully we get some good rain. Speaking of their show, Shirts Police posted on Facebook yesterday. They're actually going to have to clo down, close down Lower Seguin Road near the base oh, yes. while the Thunderbirds are doing their maneuvers, including tomorrow afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m. during their run throughs. Oh, Good to know. So, practice, so yeah. uh, I know Stephen Cavazos will have much more on, on some of that tomorrow morning on GMSA beginning at 4.30 in the morning. So that's exciting because you get to go, so don't forget sunscreen. I know, I'm off tomorrow on Lots special assignment, but I'll be at the air show this weekend, so say hi. <laughs> Bye, guys. Have a good day.